and welcome to all the participants from various states of our uh, country. Uh, I welcome our speaker, today's speaker, first speaker. I also welcome all the uh, faculties who have joined for this training. So welcome to all. Today is the fifth and the last day of our training. That is the National Online Training Program, which was themed on the new horizons of canine disease diagnostic and therapeutics. So I welcome all the participants for this. And for the knowledge of participants, uh, I would like to tell that today is the last day. Hence, after both the sessions, we will have the concluding uh, ceremony. And during that, uh, we will be giving the certificates also. And we are inviting the feedback from the participants. So all the participants are requested to please join and be ready for your response. So thank you. Now I request Dr. Pankaj Hase to introduce our first speaker, Dr. Bernidharan, sir. So Dr. Pankaj Hase, sir, please. Good evening, everybody. Welcome, Dr. Uh, Barani Dharan, sir. So today we have the expert lecture from Dr. Barani Dharan. So he received his basic veterinary degree in 1997, master's in 2000, and PhD in 2015 from Madras Veterinary College, Tunwas, Chennai. His interests are narrowed in hematology, small animal transfusion medicine, and he did a stint of clinical clearship training in dog blood banking and diagnostic imaging from 18 June 2012 to 14 July 2012 at Ohio Veterinary Medical Center, Ohio College of Veterinary Medicine, Columbus, USA under Dr. Kuto. He has pivotal in the preparation, storage and transfusion of the dog blood component, fresh frozen plasma, platelet components, packed RBC. He identified an Indian native hound breed, Hippiparai, a safe blood donor among the indigenous hounds in India, and also found the prevalence of dog blood group DEA 1.1 in India. His clinical and research experience and expertise are in transfusion medicine and platelet disorder, thrombocytopenia, and reflected in minimal original research publication as well as many more reviews and scientific abstracts and is a frequently invited speaker at many national conferences. He is he presented a scientific paper titled Oral Karkasia Papaya in the Supportive Care of Infectious Thrombocytopenia in Bleeding Dogs at the 27th European College of Veterinary Internal Medicine. The research communication was published in the Journal of Veterinary Internal Medicine. He has co-authored manual in the blood transfusion and banking along with Dr. Giger. And his future interests are more in hemo uh, hemoglobin-based oxygen carriers and canine feline blood typing modalities, indigenous red blood cells antigen, platelet disorders, and thrombocytopenia and anemia. So a uh, very excellent speaker today we have with us. So on behalf of all the coordinators and PGIVA Sakola, I welcome Dr. Barani Dharan, sir, and I request him to start his presentation, please. Over to you, Dr. Barani Dharan, sir. Yeah, thank you, sir. Thank you, uh, Dr. Hase. So it is nice uh, being with you. So thanks for that uh, very uh, the introduction of mine. Uh, we'll start out with the topic as fast as possible. So first of all, I would uh, like to thank the Postgraduate Institute of Veterinary Animal Sciences, uh, Akola, for giving me an opportunity to talk about transmission and to disseminate uh, whatever I know, whatever small quantities I know to the bigger population. So. I guess today's uh, audience and uh, people who are uh, participating will be mostly students and uh, academicians and also pet practitioners. So my presentation will be on different modules 
so that it will be easy and carry over a message of practical approach to transmission. Am I audible, uh, Dr. Kishore? Is it clear? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. You are clearly audible and the screen is visible also. Yes. Thank you. Yeah, so now we will start off with uh, acknowledging my uh, 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 Alma matter, that is the Tanwas Animal Blood Bank, which is started down uh, more than 12 years back. I would acknowledge uh, ICMR, ICAR and DBT in uh, funding my projects, uh, without which I am nowhere near. And I would acknowledge uh, my university Tanwas. Uh, my hospital, Madras Veterinary College Teaching Hospital, my department, my department of clinics, and uh, the people at ARC Veterinary Clinic, and uh, the organization called SAPAC that uh, heads the Private Practices Association in Chennai. I would also acknowledge uh, Professor Giger, George uh, Lubas, and Kuto, who taught me some of the basics of hematology. So, for students and uh, academicians, let us uh, place this PowerPoint in modules. The first module will be the function of blood and the second module will be anemia and the types of anemia. The third one will be blood groups in dogs and cats. The fourth will be when to transfuse, what cases is indicated for transfusion. And the fifth and sixth will be what materials you need for a full blood banking or what materials you need for a component blanking. So the seventh module will be when to transfuse. So that's a very important one. Eight will be what to transfuse and then uh, selection of a donor criteria will be the ninth one. Then you cross match blood and uh, then you collect blood from the donor um, and the transfusion procedures. Now post that we have modules on uh, you know what happens in case if there is a transfusion reaction and uh, uh, what happens in transmission reactions and what not to do during a transmission. So also basically in this modules, there will be a small uh, points to share on practical sips on your right hand side. So don't forget to miss that. It will be essential on a practical tip. So on the slides, you will see a, a crossbar which is uh, useful tips that will be more uh, approachable for you. So let us go on to the basics of blood transition. Please don't ask me why I'm dealing with the basic of blood transition because it is necessary that we brush our memories on hematology before we jump into bigger subjects. So we need blood, why? We need blood to carry oxygen to the tissues. We need blood because it has amino acids, glucose, plasma proteins um, which fight enemies. We need blood to remove the carbon dioxide, urea and the lactic acid as waste products. The blood constitutes a major proportion of immunological functions. We have seen in the recent episodes of Corona and what immunity is much to do with the virus. So blood has everything in it. Also, our blood plays an important role in coagulation. Remember that. It has got various hormones that gets transported into the system. The blood also regulates our pH and thereby it controls the core body temperature. These are the basic uh, functions of blood which we read in the first year physiology. I just want to memorize that and give this to you. Now as you can see what the cytology is, basic elements of blood, we will have something called the RBCs, platelets. WBCs and when you centrifuge blood in a EDTA, the, uh, the supernatant will have a yellowish fluid called the plasma and uh, the sediments will be basically the red blood cells because they are heavy and towards gravity and uh, the center portion will have a small whitish area which is called the buffy coat. So remember this is the area where they are rich in platelets and WBCs. And uh, I can just show you on the mark. This is a test tube which has the greenish portion. It's actually the whitish portion. Uh, to demarcate well, it's given in green. So remember, 
the buffy coat plays a major important role in the diagnosis of canine monocytic early issues because the rbc's does not have the parasites it is the buffy coats which has the wbc which has the parasite so when you want to diagnose a case of uh, early issues it's better you go in for a buffy coat smear which normally we don't do so than a normal rbc smear because rbc can see babesia wbc can see erlichia right so why is blood essential again the hemoglobin factor that is present it is basically the molecule of hemoglobin which has a ion where oxygen is binded so the hemoglobin is necessary to carry oxygen and transport from the blood into the tissues now for all of you who are watching the screen i have uh, put the e clinical path that is from the usa cornell lab that is left hand side that has the normal um, hematological values in canines and felines but if you actually compare in our standards in india i've been to the northern india and the southern india we've taken blood samples and run across we found that the the hematocrit uh, the hemoglobin let's take it simple as that in a in a dog that is uh, in the western countries it's a normal dog it, the hemoglobin is more than 14 to 20 whereas here we take our army and police dogs a normal dog will not have more than 12 a maximum of 13 so remember the ranges of rbc the hematocrit and the hemoglobin of normal healthy active animals is lesser compared to the western countries so you don't have to anecdotally take down the values of uh, the us and uk and treat dogs here for example now why i'm saying this is here in your uh, hospital a dog will uh, have a hemoglobin of uh, three or four you would have seen and it's still walking and trying to bite others very actual whereas uh, we patiently wait and treat the disease whereas in the western countries immediately they would have uh, transfused at least three units of blood and um, that's how they approach the case but here uh, it is not very necessary so the thumb rule is do not panic if there is a mild or moderate anemia so we are going to have a lot of time in treating the cases do not panic there is a huge difference in the field level condition so now what are the types of anemia the types of anemia include uh, immune mediated anemia non regenerative immune mediated anemia pure cell aplasia where there is uh, no production of uh, blood cells and uh, oxidant induced hemolytic anemia we've seen a lot of other cases um, we have hemolytic anemia iron deficiency anemia anemia due to inflammations uh, ckd related anemia anemia because of endocrine diseases infectious agents we say like a very typical example is monocytic ehrlichiosis to babesiosis any other histiocytic disorders anemia because of blood drug related issues and there is one nosocomial hospital acquired anemia is very common in human patients and we do have anemia when there are other miscellaneous conditions so in order to treat the case good we need to factor in the etiology of the anemia whether it is going to regenerate or not and then progress towards the approach of that so basically when the healthy individual or the dog when it has less of uh, rbc's hemoglobin or carrying capacity then they become dysfunctional and uh, they lead to a condition called anemia so in some types of regenerative anemia you are talking about uh, lysis of the rbc's it's called hemolysis and there is destruction of the blood and uh, you might find on a microscope that the number of reticulocytes are increasing than normal so it is called reticulocytosis so these are the immature rbc's your pathologist is going to count on the microscope and uh, they are majorly uh, regenerative macrocytic anemia now if 
all these uh, words are slightly confusing for you let us let us say that reticulocytosis is more of a regeneration so you can wait for some time for the blood to regenerate so normally uh, the reticulocyte index is 0.1 and if it's more than 0.1 percentage your pathologist is going to say that it's a regenerative anemia that means you have other agents that you, you do give it to the patient in order to produce more of blood cells you don't have to immediately jump on transfusion so that is more degeneration and uh, non regenerative anemia in case of very uh, chronic uh, diseases like a bacterial fungal disease very common baby cerealisia what we have sometimes it might be cancer which is uh, more related to paraneoplastic functions that cause uh, anemia sometimes uh, inflammation like uh, access gingivitis chronic bleeding in the intestines whereas you see melina and hematochezia uh, hormonal dysfunctions like hyper hypotonic cortisol and uh, hypothyroidism ckd related anemia these are all uh, certain examples of this type of anemia so in ckd anemia that is a chronic renal disease we have a low level of erythropoietin going on there remember lot of our cases which have hepatitis liver enlargement ascites more concern with liver do have a liver failure and remember drugs like chloramphenicol um anti seizure drugs like uh, um uh, potassium bromide and uh, if you take gardinal the um barbiturates on a long run they will cause anemia drugs like grisofulvin when we treat on a very long time for a fungal infection yes you could see anemia in it so for uh, ckd related anemia we can always go ahead with something called the esa esa is erythropoiesis stimulating agents basically we use the recombinant form of a human erythrocyte uh, stimulating factor that is available for on the pharmacies so in a ckd case you can uh, give weekly ones that is you can give a 100 mu gram per kilo on a weekly basis to slowly increase the pcv to 25 30. now recently we have uh, darbopoietin alpha that is uh, again next generation of esas which you can give at a rate of 0.5 mu gram per kilo per week so i normally give a minimum of weekly one shots till the pack cell volume reaches 30 to 35 and then kind of also supplement with iron injections in case of ckd so bottom line is iron dex one can be given every three four weeks once at a rate of 10 to 20 milligram per kilo in dogs so you will have to be um, very careful where you give iron dextrons because there might be anaphylaxis remember now this slide what i am talking about is about chronic kidney disease so you don't have to wait for the dog for the hemoglobin or uh, hemoglobin to come below 4 or the pack cell volume to come below 15 when the dog is at a moderate or mild anemia you can give injections to prevent the blood transfusion so our aim of this session is going to increase the packed cell volume to treat the anemia remember and remember blood transmission is always an emergency procedure to save dogs so the other type of anemia i was talking about dog is a immune mediated hemolytic anemia unfortunately in our country in india this is the most common type of anemia because we have humongous number of hemoproteins because we have humongous number of ticks in our place because being a tropical country we tick infested uh, india seems to have more of babesia erlesia and uh, something called mycoplasma so that is also very prevalent in our country so for an imha detection you can do something called a saline agglutination test that is you can add a drop of uh, saline to one drop of EDTA blood in the test tube and see for any clumps if there are clumps you might have to remove it by again adding some saline so in a IMHA case there will be still more agglutination it is not going to 
disperse and uh, you have to do a positive canine spoons test and look for the presence of spherocytosis remember imha you have to do a saline agglutination test a coombs test which is very canine specific and evidence of spherocytosis all three put together can easily lead to the diagnosis of imha at a field level if you don't have access to all these hyphae uh, tests i am talking about you can go ahead with um, a direct immunosuppression of a prednisolone at 0.5 mg per kilo for two days to see whether it is working or not if it is more immune related yes your immunosuppression is going to work so on a field related condition i would definitely advise to give corticosteroids so other non regenerative anemia is uh, basically something to do with the bone marrow in order to diagnose a case with uh, hyperplasia of the erythroids if you want to see neoplasia or the cause of non regeneration we have to do for a bone marrow biopsy which is not regular in practice because of the cumbersome procedure but actually if you start doing bone marrow biopsy it not necessarily should be on the femur um it can be on the ribs and uh, it is a simple uh, progressive procedure which needs anesthesia which is a slight risk in anemic dogs so and it's slightly painful also once you master this technique of a bone marrow biopsy your diagnosis is going to be very very easy and you should have a good pathologist with you to actually outcome the results of um your uh, bone marrow biopsies because we don't have much of time running on the case because it's already anemic and needs transfusion so remember there is also a test tube method on the left hand side where you can see a lot of uh, clots agglutinated to the surface of the rbcs and this slide actually shows two different features one is the uh, right hand side is the rule formation where the rbcs unstained uh if you carefully see they are stacked on one on one whereas agglutination you can see bunches of grapes like appearance at different levels so you have to differentiate between a rule formation and an agglutination so i told you about imha treatment plans you have to go for an immunosuppressant if you don't if they are not budging to the corticosteroids you can go for azathioprine and uh, long term treatment is necessary for imha uh to prevent recurrence so the pure cell uh, aplasia it is not very common in uh, dogs which is uh, sometimes when you start giving a lot of the erythropoietic uh, stimulating agents on a long run it might cause aplasia of the normal rbc so you have to be very careful on giving darbipoietin and erythropoietin injections so again some of the minerals chemicals and drugs like ascorbonafen uh, onions in dogs and cats and uh, naphthalene balls mm, drugs like vitamin k might cause anemia so this is about the iron deficiency anemia where uh, iron dextran as i told you earlier can be given at 10 mg per kilo and uh, some dogs and uh, cattle you can go for a oral ferrous sulfate solution that helps in treating the hypochromasia that is the parallel cells in the rbc so this module with then the with that i think uh, anemia on a generalized aspect is more than enough for you let us now jump into the uh, what is happening into dogs blood and cats blood and what are the different antigens available so <clears throat> when you take a dog erythrocytic antigen it is called the dea we have um, we have more than uh, 11 groups actually and out of which technically eight are being recognized and uh, for a practitioner's point of view um, unlike the research side um, the presence or absence of dog erythrocytic antigen 1 or 1.1 is very important because this fellow uh, da 1.1 is highly dangerous and the subsequent transfusions with the same a positive group might lead to complications so remember that so the other blood groups are 1.2 3 5 4 and 7 uh, 
um, and uh, technically a dog is supposed to be uh, um, a universal donor when it has uh, only all the other uh, uh, groups positive but negative to the 1.1 so a dog which has four that is antigen four with no other antigen like no um, 1.1 1.25 but it has four it is supposedly a universal donor so here uh, there there is a naturally occurring antibody against DEA3 now remember yeah, in yeah. dogs uh, with veterinarians is that the dogs do not have a normal iso antibody so that is why when you and me when you infuse or transfuse the dog for the first time it does not die on the table because it takes time to recognize the antigen and to create an antibody but that is not the case with cats so remember cats are crazy as you know they are not from this ah, man. Is se, is se and, uh, cat is not a dog so they have blood groups of a and a b and a b is extremely like a dog you transfer to another cat without a typing methodology then the chances of the cat dying on the table is 99 percent so do not take the risk of not typing the cat and transfusing so that is a very important thing between cats and dogs now for an emergency you can transfuse a dog's blood into a cat it's called xenotransfusion so i have done what this year i would have done at least uh, five five xenotransfusions because in cases of hemobotanella and other viral diseases where there's uh, anemia and cats the dogs uh, 10 to 15 ml of a dog's blood will make the cat survey for the next week and uh, you have time you're buying time because cat uh, blood donors are not very frequent visitors and it is very difficult to ban cat's blood so this on a emergency scale yes you can go ahead but you have you can buy time for not more than a couple of days before you're going to originally treat for the issue so should i worry about blood groups in a field level transmission i would say no for dogs and for cats i'd say yes you need to worry about it now coming into anemia these are the uh, small uh, pictures of my collections where you can see pale mucous membranes on the gum so whenever when the case comes to you you know the hands are the best uh, physical examination um, techniques and uh, you can you have to just open the mouth and open the mucous membrane open the eyes the penile mucous membranes see for uh, any plus or minus uh, actress there or blanched mucous membranes there so the other normal conditions and indications for transfusions that will uh, include something called um, the epistaxis which is again more prevalent in um, i don't know in, in chennai it is more prevalent because of the hot climates that's what they say and i think it's more prevalent because of the um factors of ticks and hemoprotozoans that are present remember for epistaxis uh, there is going to be more profuse bleeding bilaterally uh, which is not going to stop either or unless you sedate or with we can see the other conditions so this is hematemesis in dogs which also leads to anemia if it is severely involved and this is the test tubes that are agglutinated with the rbcs which is very easy to diagnose imhs so this you would have seen the your setup hospital setup or in animals which are um, having big blotches of you know the uh, ecchymosis kind of thing which is called more related to the uh,
evident in the hemorrhage cases and largest larger blotches are called achemosis yes this is uh, very evident full of scleral bleed so these are the common uh, anemic uh, dogs that you can see and thrombocytopenic drugs which have these basic issues so when we have a blood loss during surgery we need blood we need blood for uh, a case of severe tick infestation acariasis we should transfuse anemia due to leptospirosis and in puppies if you see very commonly they are uh, they become anemic with loads and loads of hookworms anemia is also very prevalent in cases of sepsis as you can see in the fourth first photograph and um, these are the puppies which have hookworm loads so remember blood along with uh, b vitamin is going to save these dogs and uh, this is the, uh, the atric area what you see so to differentiate on atric area or not you need to press a slide and remember when you press a slide if it shows blanching it is allergy when you press a slide on the skin and the red red part does not blanch it says there then it is called bleeds so it is subcutaneous bleeding so it will be more of petechiae so this procedure is called dioscopy you can just finish off the sides so some dogs we, which have uh, more anemia and ictus uh, may be prevalent in a lot of um, young dogs that are uh, um, more um, su uh, suffering with imhs they do have anemia and thrombocytopenia and they will have a concomitant ictus concomitantly without with this uh, presentation so when you see ictus it is more of a hemolytic anemia remember these are these are dogs that actually have an hypoxia and they have um, um, this is a small video and yeah so some of the dogs that require uh, synthesis uh, frequently of protheraqua synthesis or pedicardial effusion as you can see in the slides they are very vulnerable to anemia over the second or third visit so these might require transfusions on the long run so cats yes you're talking about uh, mycoplasma hemophilus which is a major important factor for anemia and as you can see here the cat is just cachectic with presentations and uh, the mucous membranes are very pale and blanched remember uh, the cat you can wait for the hemoglobin to reduce three till then you don't have to transfuse they kind of get adjusted to the anemia i don't know how don't ask me why but uh, they are not like dogs where they get paranoid and uh, into respiratory in distress when they have hypoxia till the last they don't overly breathe they just keep mum so remember when you see the mucous membrane if it is going to be pale it could be because of per perfusion so do not jump immediately into anemia that i have seen a lot of people do that when you see not all blanched mucous membranes are anemic most of them can be because of poor perfusion so what do you do you just give a bolus of iv fluids normal suffering and after 20 minutes you see the mucous membrane will be pink so remember that so mostly in cases of gdd and cats which are uh, very dehydrated you will see poor perfusion it is not anemia and uh, this is one of the videos of the cat which it shows uh, <laughs> Just hold themselves the posture and don't move. Remember, in plural effusion, we have a whole thing. They don't move. They are stubborn and they cannot breathe properly. So, remember, some of the useful tips will be blood transfusion is not the cure. Imagine that you are going to fill a tank which is already leaking, which has got a crack. So, your objective will be to refill the tank till it goes to the next station. So the major problem is the tank. So the tank I mean is the diagnosis by itself. So try to fix the disease and do not try to fix the transfusion. Remember transfusion is an emergency procedure. You still have not won the case. 
we need to diagnose and treat properly before we can, we can present again for a transmission. So now I am going to give you some materials and methods which you need. You can just note down or you can take a picture of that. It is going to be very simple. You need glass slides, cover slips, cotton gauzes, spirit, a good working microscope with lights uh, so that it is very visible, a stethoscope which is working, a normal stethoscope is more than enough, you do not have to go for imported ones. You need a tabletop centrifuge, you need hair clippers, you need something called the hemoglobinometer which I will tell you later, test tubes, you need blood bags, you need transmission sets and if you have access you can go for typing kits. So this is the hemoglobinometer which is uh, very very useful in veterinary practice, I do not know why people are not using this. Instead of investing much in a, um, uh, in a, a three cell uh, five part uh, counter uh, uh, hematology analyzer, you can just go in for this to see the hemoglobin levels. It is a, a bench top one and the highest range of uh, all the HemaQ and the Fresenius will cost you somewhere between 25 to 30,000 and the lowest range, yes we have uh, um, Chinese versions that works very good and uh, that costs you around 5 to 6,000 rupees and the hemoglobin can be detected instantly within one minute. So these are the centrifuges I was talking to you about the lab, you definitely need a Remu, Remy centrifuge which costs around 25,000 and you need a vacuum trainer, uh, the colorful list of that. So the hair clippers, yes you know how much it costs and um, when you come to banking of blood, you might require a blood traction monitor, a blood bag sealer, a tube stripper, this is a tube stripper and a refrigerator. So a blood collection monitor can uh, individually collect blood according to the desired volume that you are going to configure. You do not need an additional attender for that. This will take care of the rocking procedures and it can clamp after the uh, phlebotomy is over. A blood bag sealer works on um, uh, heat and radio frequencies where they do not lyse the RBCs. It can, the blacks can be completely sealed for a maximum number of storage. So the blood bag, blood bag refrigerator works on a principle of same fridge but only advantage is that whichever stacks you keep it is going to be maintaining at the same 4 degree centigrade for an RBC um, for our whole blood it is valid up to 28 days which can store the blood. So if your uh, university is uh, selling out the advanced version you can go in for a component uh, blanking for which um, your setup might require slightly advanced machines that include a blood bag centrifuge on the first one and uh, this works on um, centrifugation and used by the human blood banks that we contemplate in the veterinary practice and it starts off from 15 lakhs to a, a high generation of 40 lakh machine which is very useful in separating the components. So you will need a platelet agitator because once you store the uh, platelets it has to be maintained agitation at a room temperature of 20 to 24 for a minimum of 5 days. Remember platelet viability is for 5 days. You would need a plasma expressor to express the bags out and the plasma should be stored in minus 20 centigrade ten, uh, temperature and uh, remember if you collect a fresh frozen plasma it can be stored up to one year. Yes, so now the blood bank license is mandate for all. The CBSCO was in charge of uh, giving the blood bank license but unfortunately in veterinary practice there seems to be no provision for a veterinary blood bank. So that is the only issue that everybody is facing but in case if you represent the government from your side there is a high possibility of a a special uh, uh, number or a drug license for starting up a blood bank in a university tertiary level. That is how I started, that is how we started in Anwas. So the blood bags we comes with uh, different sizes, one is the 350 ml which will have CPDA and uh, that you would have seen already. This is the blood transfusion set which has a special filter to avoid micro clots and uh, we have the closed circuit component separation bags. So for practitioners at uh, field level and uh, mini hospital level, a primary healthcare center, a veterinary center can go in for single blood bags where a, a tertiary center can try the component bank. 
So for cats, there is special uh, small blood bags in the 50 ml available with the syringe. Uh, but you can devise your own thing. You can use a pediatric 100 ml blood bag and uh, measure and separate EDTA and CPDA uh, to a 50% volume. You can go for the pediatric blood bags for cats. So these are the blood typing kits that we actually procure. Most of them are made in the US and uh, most of them are made in the farms. And it's horribly expensive. Like each kit, you're talking about a minimum of 1,500 to 2,000 rupees to type one dog. So if you, in case you import these kits, you very well you can go into the websites of blood typing kits and you can purchase them. Your specialty will be identification of dogs that are negative to the DEA one and then tag them and save them as a donor for a couple of years. So for a private practice, what you can do is you can form blood donor groups and uh, I think a lot of people are now involved in this. A person from Hyderabad has started a complete um, app which uh, includes all the services and is trying to integrate um, most of these uh, states and cities where Tanwas has developed one app which has uh, the donor uh, uh, data and the blood groups and everything. So that, that is one of the other things you can integrate within yourselves on a small scale so that any person who wants nitro blood can contact this person blah blah. So next is the list of drugs that you need for a setup of a transmission medicine unit. You have to have basic antihistamines like chlorpheniramine. You will have to have immunosuppressive drugs. You should have diuretics. You should have prusimide, butrophenol, ketamine, diazepam in case we need to sedate dogs or cats for a blood, trans blood collection. So remember the decision of when to transfuse. In dogs, I told you uh, when they have anemia, they kind of have a oral breathing and. Uh, there is more type of labored uh, respiratory distress where they go in for hypoxia. So remember, you have to be careful with uh, these dogs even before you put them down for an x-ray or uh, even try attempting a proper procedure. Remember, mucous membranes are very important. So when you examine a dog, there should be um, the indications for transfusion that they say that the decision for transfusion is let us take the thumb rule of hemoglobin less than 4 in dog and hemoglobin less than 3 in cat. So there are severe, mild and uh, moderate anemia. So you can devise your own thumb rule on your situation at field level and then go in for a transmission. So for a mild and moderate anemia, you don't have to go for a transmission. For a severe one, you have to jump in for a transmission. So uh, again, uh, I have noticed most of the people are having oxygen uh, cylinders for uh, anemic dogs, but it doesn't work that way. They need more of a support of uh, direct blood that is essential. So this is one of the older dogs which is having uh, uh, some sepsis inside. If you can carefully see uh, the mucous membranes are slowly going paler and it is showing signs of uh, dyspnea that is one dog cannot sleep good and it assumes a position where uh, it can breathe good so this is dyspnea and this particular condition we call it as orthopnea when the animal finds its own space to breathe and uh, this is a, a dog which is having a pyometra which has uh, anemia because of SARS so when you uh, when you are decision to transfuse a dog, we will have to select an ideal donor, which has to be healthy and um, one to eight years of age, one to nine years is fine. It should be a vaccinated dog and free from ticks and negative for parasites, ecto and endoparasites. So you have to select a, a dog that has got a, a PCV of more than uh, 40, 45. Yeah, so we select mostly hounds. In cats, yeah, the cats should uh, at least weigh a minimum of 4 to 4.5 kilos. It should be fully vaccinated. If it is an indoor cat, it will not have mycoplasma. It should be a free of parasites. It should have been vaccinated and 
it should have a paxillary volume of more than 35 and uh, always these animals should not be pregnant or under the heat or whatever on easter period so remember cats you need to um auscultate murmurs if you have a cat which has got murmur do not take blood from the cat sometimes it's going to go crazy so this is a small uh, illustration of a cross matching even before you take much of blood from the dog it's better you take one ml from the donor and the recipient and you cross match the dog basically it is a the major and minor cross matching works out on the donor and patient's cell and the serum so it is the compatibility between the um, antibodies that are present in the plasma to the antigens that are present in the rbc's you would need a basic centrifuge uh, and uh, you need ADTA blood with a small process of um, finding out compatibility through agglutination. So this is a small illustration. You can take a picture of it so that or you can record so that it's easy for you to do in practice. And remember, uh, cross matching is not right into putting uh, two bloods in a slide and seeing that. It is a proper procedure which takes at least 45 minutes. So this is how a flea botomy is done. So the first uh, uh, picture shows a dog that is being lying down on the jugglers. First when it is shaved and it is prepped separately. Uh, the jugglers are well distended in a healthy dog. Uh, remember go for um, you know the wean lean dogs because a Labrador is going to be very very hyperactive and you will have the serious adipose tissues. This is going to be very difficult for a blood collection. So that is the jugular vein here and this is a picture that explains how one person is holding with an extended neck. I am sure everybody would have done um, flea body in your practice. So remember, when you do a jugular vein puncture, you remember it is going to be your dog and do not waste more than 2 or 3 picks. So I normally use one person who can, uh, without using much of instrumentation, you can use one person to rock the blood for a couple of um, say 10 to 15 minutes and uh, spread it comes towards gravity. So this is an easy way to avoid instrumentations, but if you have instruments, you don't you can avoid the persons. So basically this is how uh, blood collection is done. You can see the jugglers a flea bottomy is done and I normally do a small uh, twist on uh, a, a knot on the uh, blood bag so that in an emergency if something happens it's better that um, you can it's easily you can pull this knot so that you can avoid consequences so this is a okay, this is a plasma expressor uh, okay, what we used to have okay. Uh, the plasma that is getting expressed and having these in the collection and then close to one of the close cycle bags, bags uh, basically and portable blood bag collection we have. So once the centrifuge plasma is expressed over the bag, so if you can see these the RBCs are there, and uh, these bags the attached the separately, and if the entire procedure is done within six hours of time. Then it is called the fresh RBCs. Now, the RBC that is in here is called the packed RBCs. Remember, packed RBCs are different and uh, they are very highly concentrated. And the packed RBCs can survive for more than a minimum of 40 days. These are sealed by the uh, RF sealer what we have. Basically, this is a sealing process of, uh, and each blood bag has a serial number on them. Serial the 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 number on the tubes. The number of the blood bag is different. The serial number of the tubes. So you can try multiple seals so that you don't have to disturb the blood bag if you want to check for any actually. You can break up the seal. Um, if you want to check for any uh, uh, compatibility issues, you can need sampling. So, uh, so we just have to refrigerate uh, these and send the tubings. You don't have to send the entire blood bag. Concerned uh, you know, the uh, units of the sealed tubes, and you can check for uh, compatibility issues. So that is the RF sealer. What you saw. 
and uh, this is the uh, platelet agitator once the platelets are uh, centrifuged it is agitated um, the platelet agitator again, uh, of, uh, presently two 23 to 25 and, and uh, remember the platelets can so basically the viability how oh, it Agitate continuously, a minimum maintain an incubation of 22 so, degrees centigrade. Five days, the platelets are viable for maximum of so six days to seven days. Platelet collection because after a huge amount of process, uh, there is going to be a lot of platelets lying, it is going to be a waste. So, in humans, they discard bought, um, bags and bags of platelets when they don't have dengue. When they have dengue, they will not have any platelets. So, also remember. When we do a phlebotomy and we are, when we are busy in collecting blood, we have to manage client symptoms. So even before you start your phlebotomy, you have to ask this client whether he is afraid of blood or he wants to send someone. It's very important because during a blood transfusion, uh, when he kind of syncopes, then you have to take care of the dog and to take care of the owner because if it's normal IV collection of blood, it's fine. But this is going to be a procedure, so you will have to be very conscious about it. So this is a not made a loss uh, donating blood. And we've collected uh, around uh, 350 ml from the jugglers. While uh, collecting, you can see so what happened here one, was two, three people holding the dog, one holding the head, the jugglers, one holding the front limb, third person holding the hind limbs, one more person was actually holding the dog who is actually now recommended. And you can see he's got something called vasovagal so syndrome. That is called a vasovagal syndrome where they experience much of giddiness. People who see blood collection. So remember, uh, people have uh, patients when they are uh, 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 but when they have a fainting episode, remember do not pour water or give them anything to drink. Just ask them to lie down, down on a flat surface in 20 minutes they will be fine do not give them anything to drink and remember when we have vicious dogs aggressive uh, cats and vicious cats uh, it is very difficult for a uh, blood collection procedure so it's better you always ask the owner to wait outside in cats you can use vitrophenol and uh, ketamine based from combination and in dogs it's better you don't need to uh, use xylazine till the last because they'll cause uh, depression your blood pressure is going to decrease so the dog's blood pressure so then better we can use uh, a mild dose of uh, diazepam or a milder dose of xylazine before you can actually collect so remember uh, when the dogs are brought in for donation never send them back you try as much as uh, uh, procedures to collect blood from them because that is their otherwise they are not going to come to you again so, but make sure if they are violent or uh, cats are vicious, make sure the owners are staying outside. And remember, Labradors, they are very friendly dogs, they are, they are not good donors because they have very thick adipose tissue under the neck. Uh, I would uh, brief you one episode where we had a donor who stood on his legs for two hours. He said, you will have to take blood from a dog, no other chance because I brought from long way. And a couple of people tried poking left and right, but nothing worked out because it was a obese dog, more than 60 kilos. And finally, I brought my ultrasound machine inside and uh, checked the pulse over there on the jugular and near the carotid artery, and then I could easily phlebotomize the case. So, if you do multiple uh, vein punctures, uh, this is how the you know aftermath is going to be. So, be very careful and do not try for more than three vein punctures. You ask them to come tomorrow, that will be always better. And uh, once the blood is collected, this is uh, how you can connect to the um, the filter. You need a, a special uh, uh, infusion set with the filter to absorb all the microplots. So, yeah, so remember, Platelets are viable only uh, within six hours of collection. So once you once you collect fresh whole blood, you know it has to be given immediately to the dog without a time period of not extending more than three hours. So in components, you are talking about uh, blood packed blood cells, which can be uh, used in cases of uh, renal failure. So remember, um, they can uh, the packed blood cells have something 
called SAGM that is an additive in the bags that can prolong the life and make the RBCs breathe for 40 days unlike a normal blood which will take only 28 days. So renal failure is one of the most important uh, indication for plaque RBCs because they don't require the plasma. So when we come to uh, platelets we have to keep it in the agitator I told you it will be very useful for dogs that are uh, having thrombopathia or thrombocytopenia with lower platelets. Uh, these are some of the instances of dogs that have profuse bleeding on the wards and um, once you give platelets uh, instantly they issue a remarkable difference uh, in um, number of hours. So either you can go for a platelet therapy for these dogs or you can go for a fresh frozen plasma that has coagulation factors that can reduce the epistaxis. So for epistaxis I would say do not use uh, cold water, do not uh, try to mop the place, do not try to keep cotton, do not ice cubes, it's all a waste. So the best ideal thing will be to do at a field condition to sedate the dog to kind of reduce the epistaxis episodes and start on immunosuppressants which is going to work. Nothing else works because the uh, plexus present in the dog's nose is very deep inside, it's not like in humans. So yeah, some of the cases uh, where you can see uh, this is a case of Jansi the same day where we've seen three other epistaxis cases. It's been bleeding from bilaterally profuse from uh, both nostrils. It's a one-year-old Labrador and so yeah, coming to the uh, um, coming to the difference of epistaxis. Uh, if you're not, if I, I I told you specifically, do not use ice packs. Do not use tamponades. Um, you can use Butafenol, you can use uh, vincristicin that takes care of the uh, immune mediated thrombocytopenia. So, fresh frozen uh, plasma, it contains uh, label and uh, factors which has uh, prothrombins and it can um, also be given during cases of coagulopathies, toxicities, liver failure, DAC, von Willebrand disease. So, a Paxil always I told you. The cryoprecipitate is one of the other components where, uh, you know, the fresh frozen plasma is again um, centrifuged and it's kept in uh, minus, uh, it's kept in minus 80 to for a minimum of uh, 5 years. Yeah, so the cryoprecipitate can be kept for 5 years where it can be given in cases of hemophilia or bleeding disorders. So remember the rate of uh, transfusion or initial uh, phases of whole blood or any component you take should be minimal of 1 ml per kilo per hour for the first 30 minutes. So you will have to obtain uh, temperature pulse respiration and you will have to gradually increase the blood sub, uh, transfusion rates so that once you find any other uh, reactions of uh, acute hemolytic reactions you need to stop the transfusion at once and use antihistamines. So the useful tips for you will be, remember the calculated dose um, should be to increase the Paxil volume and finish off the transmission within a maximum of two and a half hours to three hours. Do not go more than that because I have seen transmission from morning to evening that is at a waste and you are going to invite more of pathogenic bacteria from the environment. So the dosage of whole blood you can take from calculations, we have a mathematical calculator but I normally go by the thumb rule that is, says that you put in 2 ml per kilo of whole blood, it will raise a PCV by 1%. Remember, 2 ml per kilo of the dog will increase 1% of the PCV or 0.3 grams of the hemoglobin. This is an easy standardized uh, measure. So for cats, we have a def uh, different formula because it is going to be um, the constant is 60 as in dogs is 90. And uh, in cats, 2 to 3 ml per kilo will raise PCV of 1%. So the transmission monitoring chart, you will have to maintain one. You, on the left hand side, you will see all the vital signs. On the right hand side, you will see every 15 minutes, you will have to record these things to see for any hypersensitivity. So remember, for a normal normalic patient, the rate will be 5 to 10 ml. For a very, very hypovolemic patient, it is going to be up to 20, kilo, 20 ml per kilo. So, in hemorrhagic socks or anything, you don't wait, you can infuse on a bolus. 
So what are the type of reactions that is going to be the next module? The type of reactions will be immediate transfusion reactions that we are causing about fever, ectric area, pulmonary edema, secret toxicity, and uh, hemolysis. So you will see the dog vomiting and there will be diarrhea, which is a very common episode I've seen. Sudden blurring and uh, facial reactions, there will be NG genetic edema. Whereas the delayed transfusion reactions will take a couple of days and most commonly in infectious. So remember, these are the atric area and uh, you know, see the eyes, eyelids are swollen and you can see patches there. And immediately if you want to go, you can go for adrenaline if you think it is an uh, emergency or we can go with the corticosteroids or chlorophenol malate. So as I told you, highs and atric area are immediate and I have seen vomiting and diarrhea. Cats, on the other hand, when you mismatch a transmission, it's going to die. So remember, non-immunologic reactions takes a lot of time and um, you have to wait for 7 to 10 days. We, have, we can manage the immunological reactions uh, on a large scale. So remember something called TACO, transfusion associated circulatory overload. We cannot, uh, we cannot pour more of uh, petrol into already filled tank. So you have to maintain the volume and you will have to also um, give way an importance to something called trally, it is transmission associated lung injury. And do not mix any other components with blood. So that uh, finishes off a, a small introduction and uh, miniature whatever we are doing and this is our blood bank in our uh, Tanuva. So we have this blood bank where we have uh, extension programs, uh, research and development. We have student training education programs and lab activities. These are some of the uh, transmission activities. We have an FARESIS machine. blood components that you can see that we have already explained to you. And this is our lab which we test blood grouping and uh, compatibility. And these are some of the cases that uh, home component transmissions take place. So we have a modified van that can uh, pick up uh, dogs at the home visit. And we do have a voluntary blood donors program where uh, they are registered. And from our hospital side, we do uh, we give them a red carpet area welcome. We do not charge them for registration and minor procedures. And we do conduct international and national uh, transmission programs yearly, but for now the corona we haven't done anything this year. And these are student activities where we have PG and PhD uh, students working in our uh, center. So the research activities we have DBT and uh, funding for the canine kind of blood typing reagents that we are going to we are investigating in modalities of blood typing in India. And we have uh, the ICMR research where we are parallelly trying to lyophilize uh, human and dog platelets. Remember I told you the storage time of platelets is very, very uh, small and uh, the platelets get wasted. So we are trying to lyophilize with a multi-institutional support. So that ends of the, this is a big subject of anemia and transmission. I wanted to just tell you in a nutshell. And uh, thank you lots for your patience and listening to you for a long time. And I thank uh, Maharashtra Animal and Fishery Science University Nagpur, Akola's uh, Postgraduate Institute uh, for uh, providing me such an opportunity. And also in this uh, platform, I will uh, definitely inquire about any collaborations which are uh, invited in transmission in medicine and hematology. We are uh, always welcome to coordinate with our departments with the clinical nurses. So thank you participants for listening. Let us have a quick discussion and hope I will be able to answer all your questions. This is my email ID you can take down and uh, this is my phone number. I am on WhatsApp. If you have any good cases uh, or if you wanted to discuss you can always post me videos and I can try to help you in my free time. So thank you. Thanks a lot. We will go to Dr. Vashne. Uh, thank you, sir. Thank, thank you, Dr. Bernidharan, sir. I think uh, there are no questions uh, at present in the question answer section. Probably uh, you have covered almost all the details of the uh, transfusion. That's why uh, no participant uh, is uh, uh, having any question, I think. So uh, now I request uh, our co-coordinator, Dr. Mahesh Ingole, sir, 
to offer a vote of thanks. Dr. Pazai. Yes, sir. Hello. Uh, Dr. Pazai, uh, sir, there are some questions uh, in the question, uh, question and answer box. Yes, sir. Uh, there is one question. Uh, yeah. With serum evaluation for T3 and T4 hormones at human laboratories will provide correct results. This is somewhat a uh, non-related question. That's okay, sir. What, what is he asking? See? Uh, whether serum evaluation for T3 and T4 hormones at human laboratories will provide correct results? Definitely not, sir. We need specific canine thyroid hormones to be tested that will include free T4 and the thyroid stimulating hormone, which is canine specific, not the human one. Uh, where we can get blood bags for use? There is another question from... Yes, that is the most difficult part and uh, the... Uh, the not a, it's a very sorry state for veterans not able to procure blood bags. And I think on a state level, you can fight it out and form a nodal officer who can actually get blood bags for the government and maintain a registry and distribute to the veterans without getting spillage. That is the best thing to do because we need to have a proper license to get a blood bag. Okay, sir. Uh, there is another question. Whether yeah. IDEX laboratories provide better results for pre T3 and T4? IDEX, uh, there is one immunoanalyzer called uh, BioNode. It's called a wet immunoanalyzer assay. So that is, uh, that's an European one. It does wonderful work. It is called, a, it's called B-Check. Okay, so yeah, it's called a B-Check analyzer. Now, there are no questions. So, lastly, I am uh, Dr. Ingole here to propose a vote of thanks. So, on behalf of the organizing committee and postgraduate Institute of Veterinary Animal Sciences, I, uh, I am thankful to Dr. G.R. Barinadharan, sir, uh, for inviting our, uh, accepting our invitation uh, and delivering a very wonderful, excellent, uh, practical-oriented presentation on anime and blood transfusion talk. Uh, this will definitely refresh uh, the, or enrich the newer knowledge and some may be helpful in practicing at their uh, <coughs> clinics also or even in, at the research institute also. So, uh, thank you. Thank you so much, sir, for your excellent uh, presentation. Thank, thank you. you. Now, I request Dr.